Kobe's not magic. Just stop. No, there's nothing. We got no respect for that system. The coaches are making huge amounts of money. Why shouldn't the uh, student athletes? Senator John McCain, welcome to The Seth Davis Show. Thank you, Seth. It's good to be with you. What an honor. Thanks for carving out some, some time for us. You seem like you're in a real good mood. I'm guessing it's uh, any combination of three reasons. The Cardinals look like a playoff team. Also, you're not running for president, and you're not running for Speaker of the House. So put a guy in a good mood. All three, except, of course, uh, our Cardinals just lost to the Rams in a very close game, uh, which you've got to give the Rams credit. But overall, we're really happy with the Cardinals. Uh, obviously, Carson Palmer is a key. Larry Fitzgerald is playing like a 21-year-old. And uh, I think there's a lot of good spirit there. We've got a good owner, we've got a good general manager, and we've got a good coach. So this is a sports show. We'll talk uh, various topics in, in sports. You moved around a lot when you were younger, mm -hmm. your dad, of course, mm -hmm. being in the Navy. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint your sports allegiances. I know now you're a big fan of the Arizona teams, but who was your first sports hero? Ted Williams, uh, head and shoulders. Uh, I saw him here in Washington when I was very young, and I idolized him, not only because of his incredible uh, athletic ability, but the fact that he spent two seasons in World War II uh, in, away from baseball in the Marines, and then, he joined the Marine Reserve out of patriotism. I'll be damned if when the Korean War broke out that they called him back on active duty. He lost two seasons uh, in the Marine Corps in Korea. Uh, can you imagine? It's hard to fathom that today, right? I mean, uh, a, an athlete leaving his professional sports league aside from a Pat Tillman. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really impossible to imagine. He wasn't happy about it, but uh, he went and served. And by the way, John Glenn once told me that Ted Williams was the best natural pilot they ever flew with. They were in the same squadron. Is that right? In Korea. I have to tell you my favorite Ted Williams story. Years ago, I signed a, it was a magazine, Esquire magazine, I sent a questionnaire. The bottom line, who's your living hero? I wrote down Ted Williams. About two months later, they arranged for me to go down and see him outside Orlando. I spent an afternoon uh, with him, and he was asking me about politics, and I was asking him about baseball, uh, including things like, I said, I heard that you could see the laces on the, on the ball, your eyes were so good. He said, no, but he studied every single pitcher, and he knew two times out of three what that pitcher was gonna throw. But most interesting was that I knew that he, while flying in Korea in a Marine jet, the first really Marine jet plane, his plane was shot up, it was on fire, and he couldn't get his wheels down, and yet he went and made a wheels up landing at outlying field. I mean, it's unheard of almost, that kind of aviation skill. So I asked him, I said, why didn't you, I know about this happened to you, why didn't you eject? And he said, um, I'll tell you why. He said, I have the canopy bow. When you open the canopy of a fighter airplane, there's a metal bow like this. And he said, I looked at the canopy bow and I looked at my knees and I knew that he was 6'3". He said, I knew that if I ejected, I was gonna break my knees and never play baseball again. I mean, it was an incredible story. Wow. Uh, a really amazing man and ferocious temper, hated their referees, <laughs> wouldn't tip his Nothing hat. you could relate to, obviously, no, no. right? Wouldn't tip his hat. You remember on his last time sure. at bat, but years later he came back to Fenway and tipped his hat. Ted Williams. What was your best sport as an athlete? Mm, boxing, wrestling? Wrestling, wrestling, boxing. wrestling, boxing, I played football. In high school I played everything, uh, mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I enjoyed wrestling probably more because it's, you know, the kind of sport that it is. Um, but I loved playing football and being mediocre then made me idolize the Carsons Palmers and the Larry Fitzgeralds of this world with their incredible talents. I, Senator, I've written often that um, sports 
matters very little, but it can mean a lot. Um, and you've written and you, and you shake your head at that, so I'm, I'm happy for you to disagree with me. And, and you've written and talked about your experiences as a prisoner of war, five and a half years, mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe three plus in solitary confinement, and how sports created an important bond with the other soldiers in that mm -hmm. camp. How so? Well, it was the common conversation. For years we lived uh, separate from each other and then we lived in the last couple of years in a big room together and of course sports was a topic. But we went for a long period of time in the late 60s uh, that be, where we had stopped the bombing so there was no new prisoners. Then we got in some new prisoners and they were in a different part of the camp we were in, so we would tap on the wall. The first thing we wanted to know was uh, sports. And of course, the topic at that time was the uh, incredible feat by Joe Namath taking the, the Jets to the Jets to victory. That was the topic of, uh, of the first topic of conversation when we got into, into conversation with them. So obviously, with people like us, you know, when you're fighter pilots, sports is, because literally most everybody I knew played sports. That's just something that usually goes with being a pilot. You feel like the word hero, though, we apply it to athletes, mm -hmm. and there's a, a, a narrative that says, well, that's, that's inappropriately applied. People like yourself, servicemen, firefighters, policemen, those are the real heroes. Do you bristle when you hear the word hero no. applied to an athlete, or are you right along with that parade? No, I go along. I, go, I, I call them heroes. And then when I meet someone like Larry Fitzgerald, who has taken his fame and turned it into doing good things, to motivating other young people, to spending time in the community. I mean, these people are model citizens. And so, in my view, they're heroes, not only on the field, but, but also off. And, and I admit that there's a lot that don't, but there's enough of them that that frankly I am really impressed with. One, let me, one guy, let me just mention, that I've got to know lately, Dikembe Mutombo. Hmm. Dikembe Mutombo, as you know, came from Africa, and the country that he came from is very poor. Dikembe Mutombo has financed a school, built and paid for a school. He is also building and paying for a hospital. He's taken his own money and and getting contributions from others, going back to the country that he came from. By the way, he didn't come to Georgetown on an athletic scholarship. <laughs> he came on an on a, on a exchange uh, scholarship, and when John Thompson saw him, <laughs> he, he thought, whoa. <laughs> As, but this is the kind of athlete that I believe are the genuine heroes. Uh, Dikembe Mutombo spends a good part of his life in Africa trying to help others in his, in his country, and, and he's done a magnificent job. Navy's beaten Army 13 years in a row. Yep. Army ever going to win this game again? You want to talk a little trash here? You know, one of the great things about the Army-Navy game is its competitiveness. And I can't say that I want Army to win, but I'd, I'd like to see them play better, and I'd like to see the game more competitive. And I don't think it's healthy to have one team dominate. And a lot of people who are watching to the, uh, won't, who are watching this show won't believe this, but over a while, uh, after a while, it does affect morale of these cadets. It really does, losing so much. And so I have a sympathy for them, and frankly, uh, it, I would like to see that, uh, that classic more competitive. And by the way, if Navy keeps winning, uh, the sponsor, the CBS, who you know shows these games, it may grow tired of that because the viewers may drop off. So there's a whole lot of arguments for an Army victory. Well, it's very gracious of you. A lot of sports fans, myself probably included, wouldn't be here. <laughs> the chief of staff of the United States Army, who just retired, Ray Odierno, big man, you've uh -huh. seen him, played football at West Point. I'm telling you. <laughs> His morale's low. Well. I, th I think it. <laughs> It, it, it ranks second only to beating the Taliban, <laughs> beating Navy. <laughs> At least it's second. At yeah. least it's second. This is not your first interview, I take <laughs> I'd like to get your feelings on college sports, mm -hmm. the NCA, and um, what role, if any, you think Congress should play in, in uh, regulating this world. As a United States Senator, what's your number one concern 
about the way the NCAA does business? I think that obviously the, these athletes uh, deserve to have uh, a certain relaxation when they're out there practicing and playing football and all that. But there should be minimum academic standards. And every once in a while we hear, I guess the last one I heard of was UNC where they they really are basically not educating them at all. And now with basketball, they aren't, you know, it's, it's one, and gun, one and done. So uh, I worry about uh, a, a lot of those things. The thing I worry a lot also about is the effect of gambling on college sports. I am not a prude. I enjoy gambling. I just worry sometimes about uh, whether somebody's going to want to make a whole lot of money off of uh, uh, particularly a college basketball game. In football, I know there's this been, been this talk about paying athletes. On its surface, it sounds like there's a certain justice and logic here because the coaches are making huge amounts of money. Why shouldn't the uh, student athletes? Well, what I worry about is if you started something like that, wouldn't we start a bidding war, the same thing we do with professional athletes? I mean, would there be a ceiling as to how much they could be paid? I don't think so. Then you'd be violating their rights. You can't put a ceiling on someone's earnings. So I think we'd be getting into a real uh, complicated situation if we paid co college athletes. Um, but look, uh, College sports is still right up there with professional sports. We want to keep it clean, but uh, frankly, on the rarest of occasions, do I think that Congress should get involved? I mean, after there's all, antitrust questions. For example, they're being sued. They've been found yeah. to violate antitrust law. Do, do they need an exemption like some of the pro sports leagues? You don't want Congress having to say in that. No, I really don't. In fact, uh, one of the one of, I thought it was a mistake by. Uh, having professional sports uh, subject uh, to exemption from the Sherman Antitrust Act because I then see them taking advantage and then uh, blacking out television in local stadiums drives me crazy in local areas when it is the taxpayers that paid for the for the uh, stadium. Now, if the owners pay for, entirely for the stadium, they can do anything they want. But if they're paying taxpayers' dollars, then they shouldn't keep those taxpayers from being able to view the game on television if they don't have a ticket. You mentioned uh, gambling, very hot topic right mm -hmm. now. Um, and it seems like you've been increasingly at least open to the idea of legalized sports gambling across the board. It's kind of hard to think of another federal law that exempts only four states, really one state for the single game gambling. And now we have the question of whether internet gambling, these fantasy leagues, need to be regulated. Where is all this headed in, in your view? Where would you like it to be headed? I have such mixed emotions about it. We all know that gambling is addictive just the way, but alcohol is, is addictive too, but we still have legalized alcohol. We had an experience with that, with banning it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really torn, but internet gaming opens up all kinds of new questions for me. What about an internet poker game where you and I are in the poker game and we're sitting next to each other and I've got a lousy hand and I raise you and I keep raising you and kept raising you and then I fold. I mean, it seems to me that there's so many ways of manipulating these games. But in the case of sports, I'd like to see some hearings on it. I'd like to see us try to come up with something that's a consensus and there is no consensus right now. But I do understand the argument, if it's legal in one state, why in the world shouldn't it be in other states? Do I have to fly from Phoenix to Las Vegas to bet on the Arizona Cardinals next Sunday? I don't think so. Um, fantasy football, a little more complex, but it sure has caught on. My God, 10 years ago, hardly anybody ever heard of it. And, and that's exempted from the uh, Amateur yeah. uh, Gambling Act, right? Yeah, because it's obviously multitude. And also, I think it would be much harder to cheat on that, you know. You'd, so it, it is a, uh, I think, $40 billion a year business. 
And so it is really big money, so it does deserve the attention of Congress. You've been critical in the past of ultimate fighting, mixed mm -hmm. martial arts. I think at one point you talked about it being even banned. Uh, are you war you, these sports growing yeah. on you? Are you warming up to them? I think They're very popular. The, the, the first look that I had at uh, martial arts fight, there was people knocking them other down, sitting on top of them and smashing them in the face. There was no referee, there was nothing. It was terrible. And they have cleaned up their act enormously. Actually, this ultimate fighting now is, isn't a heck of a lot different from boxing. So uh, they have changed dramatically. But when it, what it was at the beginning was human cockfighting. It was. I mean, I've seen people repeatedly getting smashed in the face with a guy sitting on top of them. That's not a sport. That's, that's a throwback to the Roman Colosseum. So they've changed their, their rules. I, th I approve of them now. I don't, I don't enjoy it as much as I do regular boxing because that's what I grew up with. But um, I, I, don't, I don't have objections to them now. Talk a little National Football League. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fair to say that Roger Goodell has his share of critics these days. He's got mm -hmm. the kind of problems you'd expect to have when you make $44 million a year. Uh, if you could get one-on-one -on -one with Roger Goodell in a room, nobody listening, give him direction, give him advice, what would you say to him? Uh, the one advice that I would give him, tighten up on the pads. Uh, there, I am, I've had enough to do with the World Anti-Doping Association, WADA, and, and other organizations because of the Olympics to know that the use of performance-enhancing drugs is more widespread than anybody knows. And that's an area that uh, I'm against it because of what it does to the athlete's health and, and life. Um, and also, it, takes it gives an, a certain an advantage that they have over someone who doesn't take a performance-enhancing substance. So, uh, I would say you have got a long way to go on that because every day there's somebody somewhere in a laboratory trying to invent one of these substances that can't be detected by the routine tests that they take today. That would be my first... Uh, well, you led the charge against Major League Baseball and they've tried to clean up yes. their act, so, but you feel like that football, it's better. still a, yeah. football is still a big problem in the NFL, maybe more well, than we realize? Look at, look at how long it took them after the union agreement to even start it. They stalled and stalled and stalled and stalled. Why did they stall? Is because they thought that nobody was using them? Uh, and look, the other thing, point is, Seth, I understand when I was playing linebacker on my high school football team and the guy said, hey, take these pills and you can play in the National Football League, I'd say, where's the bottle? I mean, you can understand it. Of you can understand it with a young athlete. That's why the restriction and restraints have to come from above. How's the NFL doing on the concussion issue? Better? Still a ways to go? I, I think they're doing better, but like boxing and other contact sports, we're either going to have to live with the reality that, that there's going to be head injuries. It just, unfortunately, is what was it Vince Lombardi said, football isn't a contact sport, it's a collision sport. And that's always a danger. I think we ought to continue research on helmets. We ought to do everything we can to look at treatment. Uh, but I, I'm afraid that it's always going to be part of the game. I have no quarrel with what, what the NFL is trying to do on concussion prevention. I don't know what more they can do to tell you the truth. You uh, once called Richard Sherman a loudmouth. <laughs> <laughs> he probably took it as a compliment. <laughs> he's, he's a great athlete, but... Be a good uh, congressman one day, maybe. I think he would make a great Democrat senator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst compliment I've ever heard. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a great athlete, and I understand the macho aspects of it. I think it was uh, that I called him that because it was after a game in which they had defeated the uh, Arizona Cardinals, and he had uh, done a little celebrating. 
but I'm not as angry at him as I am at the Los Angeles Dodgers. And when they, when they sewed up the NL championship, they went and jumped in our swimming pool. Not cool. Uh, and then also did something else in the swimming pool. And uh, I will never forget those spoiled brats for that. <laughs> I can't resist asking you a little bit about politics. I promise I'm not mm -hmm. going to ask you about Donald Trump. Um, we keep hearing about how polarized Washington is, how divided our mm -hmm. politics is, how vitriolic and bitter mm -hmm. our politics is. But if you read through history, um, no matter what period in American history you're studying, that always seems to be the case. And we've been through a civil mm -hmm. war, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. You came here in 1987. Is it much worse? And when you yeah, here? It's, it's much worse. It is. Um, yeah, let me give you the best example that I can. Ronald Reagan never attacked people personally, disagreed and strenuously and made strong arguments, but never got personal. Um, when we were in a real serious recession in 19, early 1980s, he used to spend time with Tip O'Neill, the liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, very liberal Speaker of the House, and he would come over, O'Neill would come over and have drinks with him. And they would drink and they would talk. And finally, at one point, when Social Security was about to go bankrupt, they both walked out of the White House and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise your taxes. We're going to raise the retirement age. We're going to have some tough measures, but we're going to save Social Security. Who could fight against that? Where is the Ronald Reagan and the Tip O'Neill today? And so much of this has gotten so personal. Look. I just don't think it's right to call people dummies and losers and all of those kinds of things. I haven't done that to a, a political opponents. Uh, I, look, I believe a fight not joined is a fight not enjoyed. But you, you, wanna, you can take care of an adversary with an intellectual argument and, and a debate about the issues of the day. So, um, yeah, I think it's more polarized with this experience now of Boehner stepping down is a good example of it. Um, and what it's done, it's contributed enormously to the low opinion that the American people have of us, 12% approval rating. Back when Ronald Reagan was president, I'll bet you that the approval rating of Congress was in the 60s and 70s. So we've got to turn this around. We've got to turn it around. And you still want to be here. And now you've said you're running mm -hmm. for re-election next year, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. You'll be 80 on election mm -hmm. day, if my math mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. so you got a ways to go to catch Vin Scully, by the way. I think he's yeah. 87. He's still working. But and my mother is 103. Is, is yes. It? God bless her. Yeah. Yeah. So we got so you got a few more terms in you. But you kind of remind me a lot of coaches that I interview who are competitors, um, who don't want to leave the arena, who believe passionately, who are fortunate enough to have good health. Are you just not mm -hmm. the retiring kind? I think the most important thing is that I'm chairman of the Center Armed Services Committee. I wanted to be two things in my political life. One was president, obviously, Whoop, so much for that. But the second was uh, to be chairman of the Center Armed Services Committee, which my predecessor, Barry Goldwater, was. We've got a world in more turmoil than any time since the end of World War II. That's the opinion of Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, Madeleine Albright, you name it. And we've got more refugees in the world than any time since the end of World War II. So, and we've got a military that needs to do a lot of reforms and a lot of fixes. And so I've been busier in the last year as chairman of the Armed Services Committee than I have ever been at any time in my career. And so I think I've got a lot to do and I think I can do it. And that's really why I, I'd like to, why I'm seeking reelection. And by the way, it's gonna be a tough fight. It's gonna be a real tough fight. Most of them are. Senator McCain, this was an honor. Thank you for having us. Good luck to your Cardinals. Thank you, Seth. And, and, thank our, you for your and our Coyotes. We didn't even talk about how we got, <laughs> we got to keep them in Arizona and how the, the Diamondbacks need pitching. There's a whole lot of things. You now better come the back. Suns, the yeah, the this, Suns going to have an all right season? Uh, they, they, they still haven't, uh, you know, ever since Steve Nash left, uh, they haven't been the same. Well, I'll see what I can do for you. Thanks, thank you for being here, Senator. Okay. Thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you.